Okay, folks, we're going to kick it off. Welcome to the afternoon session, panel session for Crypto Festival. Okay, we got, we're, have got four excellent contributors who are going to get things rolling, also from four very different points of view. Okay, and I'm going to give them a bit of time to set out their case, okay, or to put their main points. But then it's really up to you guys as well. This is supposed to be a discussion event. Obviously, a lecture theatre <coughs> is not necessarily the natural place for that. Okay? But don't, it's not a lecture, right? although we're in a lecture theatre. This is a DIY event, in case you hadn't tweaked that. Right? Everyone's here, has organised themselves to get here and organised themselves to do the stuff that they're doing. And it's the same for you guys. If you want to get something out of it, then try, try taking part. It's totally up to you how much you want to contribute. There's going to be plenty of space. We've got a two-hour slot. Okay, so I'm going to let each of our panel um, lay out what they think basically is the problem with what's going on at the moment and hopefully say something about what they think the next steps are because that's also really the theme of Crypto Festival. Okay, it's not just to come along and find out quite how sinister we <laughs> are but also to look to what you and also what we can do collectively about this situation. Okay? And we're going to have a little bit more about that at the wrap-up. So it is about finding out what is getting some real idea, some insider sense and I think that's very much this panel as well, whether it's an insider view of the politics or the, the sort of dark politics, if you might say, or an insider view of the technology or an insider view of the political process. That's what we're going to get to start this session off. So it's really seeing what's really going on beyond the hype and the headlines and the stuff that people like to chat about. What's really going on here? Because it is something, it is significant, but let's, let's find out what its dimensions really are and then let's discuss what, if anything, we can do about it. And what if that is technical and what if that is political and what if that is something else? <coughs> okay, that's really um, <coughs> the theme of this session and also the theme of the festival as a whole. Uh, I'm going to allow the panellists to introduce themselves for at least two reasons. One is they can do that better than I can, and uh, actually that's probably both reasons. I'm just pretty bad at introductions, <laughs> as you can probably tell. Okay? I'm going to be facilitating the session. My name is Dan. The way we're going to run it when we get to questions is we've got a microphone, which we'll try and get round to people, so hold your horses while we get the microphone to you. I'm going to try gently steering the discussion so people don't jump in on top of each other. Apart from that, it's going to be pretty freeform. Okay? Any questions before we kick off? So... Over to Annie. I think I might use this. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. yes. Excellent. Um, just to save my voice, things that I've always got a lighter voice. Yes, um, my name's Annie Mashon. I'm a former British intelligence officer with MI5, which is the UK Domestic Security Service. Um, I worked there in the 1990s before becoming involved in a very notorious whistleblowing case at the end of the 1990s. And today what I want to talk about is a little bit of the experience on the inside and also on the outside once you do blow the whistle, because of course whistleblowing is a very uh, current, uh, current idea at the moment, particularly post-Snowden, um, but then extrapolate that out into issues of privacy, um, why we need it, not just on, in the tech world, not just in the digital world, but also in the real world, particularly if many of us get involved in activism, activist groups, Many of us are angry about certain aspects going on in the world. Many of us want to make a difference. And it's how to be effective in making that difference, realistically protecting your strategy, your thinking, your planning, that type of thing, that I want to give you a little bit of insight into, uh, just to kick off the discussion today. <coughs> so as I mentioned, I was recruited in the early 1990s uh, by accident, I never wanted to be a, a spy, um, to work for MI5. And they, at the time, were winding down uh, their section which looked at counter-subversion, which was political activism within the UK. However, they didn't wind it down fast enough at the end of the Cold War. So even though I'd been recruited with the expectation of working as a counter-terrorism officer, I found myself working for the first two years in MI5 in a little section called F2 that did indeed watch and investigate and infiltrate extreme left and extreme right-wing groups. I then moved on to the Irish section and then on to international terrorism. So I just want to dip into a couple of the, the bits that I saw there, which made I and my former partner and colleague, a man called David Shaler, became the, the no -no notorious whistleblower at the end of the 1990s, to give you a sense of the sort of work that they do and also how it can go wrong, and then what it's like and why we went on the run and what it's like to go on the run. So I was recruited, I worked in F2, and that was actually quite a historic education for me, looking back over the decades at the sheer scale of what MI5 had done to investigate their fellow UK citizens for their legitimate, 
political activism, their legitimate political beliefs. And they looked at groups like Militant Tendency, the Socialist Workers' Party, anarchist groups, um, as well as some of the far-right groups at the time. And one of the things that became very clear at that time was that they also had a duty to investigate people who wanted to be politicians in this country. I was in the section there in 1992 in the run-up to, to the general election, and anyone who wanted to stand had their names cross-referenced with the MI5 records. And if they had a file, that file was pulled out, and that file was reviewed by people like me. And we had to write a threat assessment about if they're elected or if they get into government, will they threaten our national security? Now, at that time, many, many files came out of registry of people who weren't that famous, but who went on to form much of the Labour government from 1997 onwards. So we're talking Tony Blair down. Anyone who was anyone in the new Labour government had a file um, held by MI5. And I think that is a real problem for our democracy, because you have a situation where the politicians have secret information held on them. They probably suspect they have secret information held on them, but they don't know what it is. And also, those very politicians go on to be the notional political masters of MI5 and MI6 if they become Home Secretary or Foreign Secretary. And they have this information held on them. So I think that's very much a sort of problem in a democracy where the tail is effectively wagging the dog. The spies have too much power or too much suspected power over the people who are supposed to um, hold them to account. And I think we can see this continuing on to the current day where politicians always close ranks to defend the actions of our spies. Even recently, William Hague justifying GCHQ's endemic dragnet surveillance of all of us, not just in the UK, but across Europe and North America too. So this is a bit of a problem. That was one of the reasons I became slightly disillusioned to begin with, working in MI5. Then there were a series of cases in T Branch, which was the Irish section, where bombs that could and should have been prevented on UK streets exploded and innocent people died. And then MI5 and the police would lie to cover this up. And they could lie very effectively. If you ever hear a politician in the news say, I know exactly what the spies get up to, they brief me on everything, I can say with certainty they don't. Because they can't be investigated by the political classes, they have to take on trust what they're told. The politicians have to take on trust what they're told. And they are lied to routinely. So that is not proper oversight. Finally, in the international section, there were three cases. One was an illegal phone tap on a Guardian journalist. Another was the wrongful conviction of two innocent students for conspiring to carry out a terrorist attack in London in 1994. MI5 knew they were innocent. MI5 refused to disclose that information to their defence. And of course, they were therefore convicted and were sentenced to 20 years in prison. But the straw that broke the camel's back was the case that became known as the Gaddafi assassination plot. And this was something that David, who at the time was the head of the Libyan section in MI5, was briefed on by his counterpart in MI6, who had a snappy James Bond number of PT16B, a bit of a mouthful. And this basically was a case of MI6 funding a group of Islamic extremists with known links to the new Al-Qaeda franchise to try and assassinate Gaddafi in 1996. And this attack went wrong. Manifestly, Gaddafi survived to be assassinated at a later date. Um, innocent people were killed when the explosion occurred, and innocent people were killed in the ensuing security shootout. Plus, on top of this, MI6 had failed to get prior written permission from their political master, the Foreign Secretary at the time. Ironically enough, a man called Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who now chairs the Oversight Committee in Parliament and doesn't do a very good job there either. So we had a situation where MI6 was effectively a state sponsor of terrorism abroad, trying to carry out an illegal operation to assassinate a foreign head of state which goes wrong and kills innocent people. How much more heinous can you get? So this is why we decided to resign and why we went uh, to blow the whistle. And we did a Snowden, this is a long time ago, but we can, I can hold my hand up and say we did a Snowden before he was even out of school. And this was in 1997 when the story broke. We fled the UK and went literally on the run around Europe for a month. Uh, we had to live in hiding for a year and in exile for another two years in France. I have to say, as a handy hint to any activists, if you ever have to go on the run, go to France because Paris is beautiful. <laughs> and they protect whistleblowers. <laughs> and David Shaler went to prison twice 
First of all, when the British government failed to extradite him from France in 1998 to stand trial, and then after he had voluntarily come back to the UK, been charged, tried and convicted of a breach of the Official Secrets Act, and he was sent to Belmarsh. So it's quite a long and drawn out saga. What I wanted to, I wanted to run through that, just to give you a flavour of what the sorts of things the spies get up to. But also, from that experience, it became very clear to me what it was like to live when you're being pursued by the police and by the spies. So this is back in the good old days of the 1990s, and we knew that we were living without any privacy at that time because we were being investigated and surveyed at that time. So just to give you a sense of what it was like, we couldn't guarantee that we could have a private conversation in our home because there might be a property bug placed in it. We couldn't guarantee even that we had privacy in our own bedroom because there might be a property bug based in it. Now, the one psychological trick that I used to use just to get around that was to say, well, who cares? We're having more fun than they are. So if you ever feel under surveillance, that could be a good little psychological trick to help. But also we knew our communications were being bugged, our telephones were being bugged, our early emails were being bugged, and which meant, of course, that even if there's a family crisis and you, know, you need to speak to your mother or your father about something, you cannot do it privately. And that is very corrosive. Plus, and it got worse, we found out later that a couple of our friends had been pressured into reporting back on us. And we don't know how long that went on for. We suspect a number of years. So we got to a point where we didn't even know whom we could trust within our social circle. So living with that sense, I suppose it was like living under the Stasi, where you don't feel you have privacy in any part of your life, was incredibly debilitating, incredibly frightening, and incredibly corrosive to the human spirit. <coughs> and this, I think, is now what we're all looking at. Of course, in the 1990s, in that specific case, it was a targeted operation, and I suppose they could justify it. But what we have now with this explosion of technology is the fact that we are all potentially living with that lack of privacy. And of course, many of us here are aware of the need to protect our online activities. But the other thing as well you need to perhaps be aware of is that your little spy devices in your pockets can also start spying on you actively. So you might think you're safe because you, you use all the right tools that everyone's going to learn today, like Tor and OTR um, and encryption, PGP, things like that. But if, if they really want to target you, they can infect whatever you're using, like your spy phone or your computer, um, with software which will then turn that into a recording device or even a video device. And I know that because it's happened to some of my mobile phones, which malfunctioned. And then people could hear what was going on around that phone if it was just sitting on the table in front of me. It became a recording device. So it's great that people want to try and take protection when they're actively online, but just be aware that even if something's sitting there benignly on your desk, it might be spying on you. So it's this lack of privacy, I think, is something that we all need to be aware of now. Um, of course, thank you to Mr Snowden, we are all aware of it indeed. Many of us have suspected the malign use of Facebook, the lack of privacy on Facebook, that there might be back doors to the NSA on Facebook or Google or whatever. And of course, now we know that is indeed the case. And it's very difficult to ensure our privacy. And people often say to me, well, you know, if I'm doing nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. Well, all I can say to that is, that's crap. <laughs> Everyone's got something they wouldn't want to share with the entire world. That's called privacy. But more importantly, more importantly, I think, what might be legal now might no longer be legal in the future. And one of the examples I always think of when I say that is, you know, you could be out there protesting against something, waving a placard on the street, or being part of an Occupy group. And that's fine, you're exercising your democratic rights in a notionally free democratic country at this point. But what if the laws change? What if the definitions change? What if two years down the line, you've been fully identified as an, an Occupy activist, and suddenly Occupy are now deemed to be a domestic extremist group, or indeed a terrorist group? And that might sound fanciful, but that's what happened to the Occupy group in London two years ago. A letter was leaked from the City of London Police, which had been sent to all the banks around the area, basically calling Occupy a domestic extremist slash terrorist group. And of course, once you get tarred with the name terrorist suspect, we all know quite what can happen to you. So the goalposts can shift. What is legal today might be illegal tomorrow. And I suppose the most stark social example of that was what happened in 1930s Germany, where you know, just being a trade unionist or a journalist who was critical of the regime 
could suddenly be disappeared and thrown into a black prison and tortured or even murdered with no judicial process. The slide away from democracy, once it starts, can cascade. And because we have this dragnet surveillance and because we have the storage of all this information now, this incredible capacity, you know, a supercomputer the size of a city built in Utah and things, what we might be doing now might be entirely okay, but then if it's stored and the laws change, <clears throat> suddenly it could be used as evidence against us. And in fact, there's been reports that even though they can't crack in properly used encryption, they're still storing all the encrypted messages in the hope that one day they will be able to decrypt them. So even there, you know, you've got to be aware of what you're saying, what you're thinking. But that is one of the key problems. In fact, I think that is the fundamental problem about this erosion of our privacy, because the very fundamental reason we need privacy, <clears throat> the very fundamental reason privacy is an enshrined human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course, which were um, pulled together in 1948 in the immediate aftermath of World War II to stop the horrors of that sort of thing ever happening again. The reason it is a basic human right is because without privacy, we start to self-censor. Without privacy, if we're always thinking about who might be looking over our shoulder and what we're watching on our computer, what we're reading, what we're ingesting, <clears throat> what we're saying, what we're planning and who we're planning it with, if that is all known, <clears throat> sorry, my voice, if that is all known, then we will begin to self-censor in the fear that in the future it could be used against us. Not necessarily in a court of law, but it might be used in a black torture chamber somewhere even. So it's that self-censorship that is most dangerous and most corrosive for what is supposed to be a democracy. And that is what we are at risk of losing if we feel under threat from our lack of privacy because of the NSA, the GCHQ, and all the other alphabet soups of intelligence agencies around the world. And sure, the NSA and GCHQ are probably the most complicit and the most aggressive in what they're doing, but all the other agencies love to get crumbs off the table. Every country has the same problem. And also, as I said, our governments might think they know what our spies are getting up to, but they very rarely get the full, if any, of the picture. So I think this is why the idea that crypto parties have exploded around the world is just so heartening. The fact that more and more people are realising that they cannot get their governments to guarantee their privacy. They can't expect their governments to uphold that basic human right. That we have to take that into our own hands. We have to develop tools that will guarantee our privacy as citizens. And it's fantastic that we have the crypto parties where those who know can impart that information to those who don't know. Those who know why it's important can impart the reasons why it's important to those who don't know and don't yet care. And that, I think, is one of the key steps. So it's great, and I know there's some fascinating sessions later on some of the real basics, the tools that are still considered relatively safe, like TOR um, and OTR, which I think stands for Off the Record. Yes. I always know it as On the Run. And of course, OpenPGP. So it's great that we're doing that and being conscious and spreading the word about the need for this. However, it's not just the digital realm that we need to be aware of this mass surveillance. So I just want to run through, if anyone gets involved in activism, you know, if you're out there with your placards and you want to plan and strategize, none of us, I think, would use Facebook for that now. Surely, surely, surely. But even that, you have to protect online. Don't give away your thinking for free, because if you do that, you're just doing the spy's job for them. This is what spies have to sit behind desks and spend weeks on trying to work out who was meeting with whom, what they were going to do, what their strategy was, what their goal was, etc. But of course, in the real world, there is a growth in surveillance too. And we've seen this with scandal after scandal emerging over the recent years of, for example, the undercover cops, who are full-time police officers, who then infiltrate groups and live as an activist within that group for 13 days out of every 14. And this has been going on for decades. There's no doubt about it. It's ironic that I, um, when I was working at F2, the council subversion section, I did indeed have to work alongside some of these coppers who infiltrated some of these groups. And it was interesting that generally they were always pulled out after a year or two because they seemed to be in danger of going native. So I don't know if it says something they were just having more fun or they actually got the political message or whatever, but it was great to see. So we have those people, and of course now the senior police officers are saying, oh, no, no, we won't do that again, you know, it's all finished. I don't trust them because they said it was all going to be finished in the 1990s and it was just rebooted under a different organisation, a different umbrella. There's also, of course, um, the endemic electronic surveillance, but there's also, of course, the explosion in private spy companies. 
And this is something most people forget. You know, if you're an activist, you're in a group, and you think, that so-and-so looks a bit dubious, I'm a bit suspicious of them, perhaps they're a spy. Very often, it's not going to be state-level surveillance. It's not going to be MI5. It might not even be the police. But what does happen, if you're in a, a pressure group that's campaigning against corporate interests, mm -hmm. then you will get these mercenary spies being employed by the corporations to infiltrate and spy. And I remember reading some um, statistic a few years ago. There was one of the big environmental camps that someone sort of rather flippantly said they reckon 25% 25 25 of the people there weren't activists, they were spies of some flavour or another. <laughs> so it's always it's great to take precautions when you're in the digital realm, but you also need to think about the other precautions in the real world too. Because as more and more of us do lock down our digital privacy, they're going to have to go back to these old-fashioned techniques, human intelligence, getting the sources in place. So it's worth trying to keep an eye out. One of the key giveaways that keeps coming up, and I'm not spilling any secrets here, one of the key giveaways, two key giveaways, of anyone trying to infiltrate a group is, one, they will always offer immediately to do all the boring jobs nobody else wants to do, because that means that they're given a lot of trust very quickly. Or two, that they tend to have transport, so they can drive you all around to get to places and things. Um, but also this sort of agent provocateur aspect is usually a giveaway. Someone's new and they're immediately pushing to take things more and more and more extreme. And finally as well, the sense that if someone is around as an infiltrator, they still have to live their own private life at some point. So if there are unexpected absences, or you don't get to meet their friends, you never really know who their family is or their social circle, where do they go at the weekend? That sort of thing can be an interesting giveaway too. So it's worth bearing in mind your privacy in the real world as well if you're involved in campaigning. It's not because we're doing anything wrong, but it is because we have something to hide, and that's called our lives and our plans and our basic humanity. And if we lose that, it corrodes our spirit. So I think on that note, um, just one final point I want to make is a tribute to um, my new personal hero, which is, of course, Mr. Edward Snowden. I just want to announce that there is a new um, organisation that is about to be launched. I mean, there's already the Edward Snowden Defence Fund, which is receiving huge amounts of donations, many, many, quite small donations, but lots of them from around the planet, even now. Um, and that can be found at freesnowden.is, which is Iceland, I think. Keep it safe. Um, so please, if you feel minded, do donate to that. But there will also be a bigger, more encompassing organisation to protect journalists under threat, and also particularly the whistleblowers under threat, as and when they emerge, because there will be more, there are more, who will come out and do what Edward Snowden has done, despite the terrible risks that they face doing it. And they are providing a service to us all across the world and giving us a chance to fight back while we still have that opportunity and means to fight back. It's very much a sort of arms race between surveillance and um, our need for privacy and our understanding of why we need it and why we need to defend it. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm going to be intimately involved in launching it in a couple of weeks. At the moment, it's got a slightly clunky title, which is Journalistic and Source Protection Defence Fund. Snappy, I can't even remember it, so how's anyone else going to? I think it's going to be something whittled down to something like the Whistleblowers Defence Fund or something. But keep an eye out because we'll be, many of us, speaking out there. Daniel Ellsberg is a spokesman. Ray McGovern, ex-CIA, is a spokesman. Professor Ava Mogul, hero to many of us, a spokesman. So keep an eye out, and as you see it come out, please push it around, spread the word, and just you know, keep in the back of our minds the service and the sacrifice and the danger that this young man has put himself into to confirm all our darkest fears. Thank you. So what I thought I'd talk about is uh, what the Snowden files mean in practice. And uh, my perspective is that um, I've been working with crypto for something like 30 years. Uh, I worked in the 80s for a number of organizations such as Barclays Bank and Standard Chartered Bank. And I'm kind of recovering from that now. I have been for some time at the University of Cambridge. And I was one of the people who, along with Ian Brown and a number of others, set up the Foundation for Information Policy Research back in 1998 in order to campaign against what became the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Bill. So how does Snowden change stuff? I thought I'd provide a number of um, perspectives. If you're a foreign government, if you're the government of Switzerland, or the government of Swaziland, or the government of North Korea, it's just business as usual. 
because this is what the agencies have been doing since God was a boy. And if you didn't pay attention to what was published in the Hot Six story, or the Crypto AG scandal, anybody remember that? Two, three, okay, back, in, back during the Iran-Iraq war, the Iranian um, cryptanalysts realized the Iraqis were reading all their traffic. And um, so they figured that the NSA must somehow have broken all the machines that they bought from this nice Swiss company called Crypto AG. So they got the sales rep, they took him to Evin prison, and they told him what would happen to him if he didn't spill the beans. And he did. And it turned out that the NSA had secretly bought Crypto AG in 1953 mm -hmm. and had um, run it as a front company ever since. Um, the curious thing is that lots of non aligned country governments still buy their cryptography from Crypto AG. Because where the, where the hell else is there? If you buy from a UK company, it will have backdoors uh, placed in it for GCHQ. If you buy it from a, an American company, it will have backdoors for the NSA and so on. So this is old stuff. If you are an IT major, if you're Google or Microsoft or Yahoo, you didn't imagine that the NSA would pull your bits off the backdoor between your data centers. You mean you didn't read all the stuff that Duncan Campbell and Nikki Hagar and others wrote about Echelon? Hey, well, there's a preacher in Scotland giving the hellfire and brimstone talk to his congregation, and there, there will be wake, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, he said, in hell. And people will say, but Lord, we didn't he ken. And the Lord will turn to them and he'll say, well, you can do. <laughs> What if you're a small corporate? I was talking to a guy in such a circumstance just by email this morning. <laughs> Suppose you've got a company with a thousand staff and a turnover of a billion or so, and you occasionally go and drill oil wells in you know, the Falkland Sound or Kazakhstan or whatever. Should you be worried? Well, um, uh, the director of the NSA went on TV recently and said, we don't do economic intelligence. The reason for that is that that's the CIA's job. <laughs> and the CIA gets a copy of all the feeds that the NSA gets, and they have even more money. They have even more billions in the NSA. So if you don't employ anyone who's ever been to Usenix security or Eurocrypt or whatever, what can you do? Where do you buy products you can trust? Anything that you can buy on the market that gets sold to corporates by guys in suits has got to have an export license from the country where it's originated. And that means, with very, very few exceptions, that the local spooks have a backdoor, and the backdoors get traded. So how can you buy anything that will secure your VPN? The Snowden files make clear that all VPN products on the market anywhere are clicked to decrypt. How do you protect your stuff? What about guys like me, researchers, well, we've experienced GCHQ and friends messing around with our research for 20 odd years. And the eye opener for, for us was this, that it, it always used to look like it was sporadic and opportunistic. There'd be occasional interventions. You know, somebody from GCHQ would offer a studentship to some other organization you were thinking of doing business with, provided you didn't do business with them. And we now know that this is a $250 million a year funded program. Now, a number of universities have signed up to what's called the ACME CSR scheme. You're invited to become an accredited center of excellence in cybersecurity research. And even those of us who refuse to have anything to do with this find that there are other people at our universities who are quite happy to sign on the farm and get the university accredited. So for 50,000 pounds per university, GCHQ compromised the brand name of Cambridge and UCL and Royal Holloway and many other places, why? One studentship, right? And the studentship has got to go with somebody who, to somebody who's capable of being, um, of undergoing a developed vetting, you know? So if you know any straight fight white boys whose fathers were born in Britain, who want to do a PhD in cryptography, there are eight universities who are eagerly looking to recruit them. So, these strange things are, are more than just an annoyance for academics. For example, one of the big threats facing the internet 
is that some bad person might write malware which tears up the routing fabric, for example, by announcing lots of bogus routes and then tearing them down again. And so there's an initiative underway, BGPSEC, to provide mechanisms to sign um, routing announcements and to verify these before you rely on them. The problem is that the working group, which is doing BGPSEC, has the same NSA contractors on it, who previously worked to standardize VPNs, which are now, as we know, all fit to decrypt. And so the message has sunk in to the SIDR working group um, that the group's output will be of no value to anybody um, because nobody's going to trust them. The same happens with the new SHA-3 um, hash function proposal from NIST. They ran a competition to find a hash function. NIST then decided that it was going to tweak it a bit, and now nobody's going to touch it with the barge pole. So, okay, um, the mechanisms that were previously used to mess around with technical standards aren't going to work that well anymore. But we face the, the fact, the reality, of an active opponent who will be trying to screw around with everything that we try and standardize on. Okay, so what's the message for activists? Well, I think Annie pretty much uh, put her finger on the button. It may be the case that for the next year or two, the cops won't be allowed to shag you. Um, but, so what will we do instead? Well, they are sending that nice and cool quite strongly. Oh, <laughs> that's nice. And, and of course, they know exactly what sort of people we fancy, because they've seen all the, all the porn that we view. And once you get Google Glass, Every time you look at a girl or a guy for 300 milliseconds or 760 milliseconds or whatever, that will be down on the government computer, right? So you'll be able to have an automatic program to say, yes, Agent P167 is exactly the person that we should get alongside such and such. One was the modern technology, hey. But what we're doing at the moment, we had at Cambridge a case where the special branch wanted to get close to some activists and because of some strange rule and not uh, messing around with Facebook, they decided to recruit a student. And of course, if you're recruiting a third party, as Annie pointed out, well, that's a private intelligence service. It would appear that all bets are off. So the police can recruit agents who will get up close to people. What do MI5 still want? They say they still want a comms database. We were told for years, under both Labour and the coalition government, that the security service absolutely needed a communications database or the world would end. We'd be taken over by terrorists and pedophiles. It now turns out that they had one all the time. They still say that they need one. Presumably, it's a little bit like Trident. You know, the Americans have got a nuclear deterrent, so we should have one too. The Americans have a communications database, so we should also have one too, even though we can rely on theirs. Hey, what's going on? Um, I think the thing has ch that has changed is that now, for the first time, we've got a real chance to do better operation security. <clears throat> because in the old days, if you were an anorak in this trade, if you were a security researcher, if you read the stuff that had been written by Duncan Campbell and Nicky Hagar and you'd heard of Annie and David's story, you had some idea what might be done against you if you were targeted. But from the point of view of the average person in the street, this was never quite real. If you would explain what would happen to people or what could happen to people, they'd say, no, nah, no, nah, this is a conspiracy theory, forget it. Now we've got the internal documentation. We can show people the NSA slide decks. This is how it works. This is what is going to be done to you if you ever come into the sites of those in power. There's all sorts of technical stuff that people work on. Um, Tor, tails, OTR, cubes, steganography. An idea we were kicking around this morning is that if you are going to um, encrypt stuff on social media sites, um, then perhaps you need a new language, um, a language where the, what you say goes through a cryptographic transformation and comes out looking like language, but not quite. Hey, there's all sorts of strange things you can play around with. In addition to this, there's censorship resistant systems of various kinds. Um, this is something that you know, we worked on in the 90s and we've seen peer-to-peer -peer stuff coming off because of the war between um, kids and music companies. And then of course there are security economic models. One of the powerful ways of understanding what goes on here um, is to apply the tools of, of game theory, behavioral economics and so on and try and model, for example, what goes on between a subversive group 
and the police force is trying to crack down on them. And you end up being able to derive models for the circumstances in which you can form cells, for the circumstances in which solidarity between various groups who are opposing a government will appear or will break down and so on and so forth. This sort of stuff is important from the point of view of understanding what's going on. But I think it's a mistake to think that privacy is only about the dark heart of the state, right? The defense, intelligence, home office, nexus, cabinet office, 10 Downing Street. Because there's all the sort of fuzzy bits of the state, health, education, welfare, housing, and so on, collect even more stuff about our lives. And of course, that becomes available to the other organs of the state as well. Something that people should care about right now is care.data. This is a system um, being pushed um, by David Cameron's government. Um, it's the brainchild of Tim Kelsey, who was his transparency czar, right, making us transparent, and is now the CIO at NHS England. Care.data is going to upload your GP records starting early next year, unless you opt out. To do this, you have to go to your GP and tell them quite explicitly that you want to be opted out, not just of having your records shared within care.data, but even having them uploaded in the first place. Your GP has a strong incentive to fudge this if he or she can, because GPs get a fair chunk of their income from what's called QOF, Quality and Outcomes Framework, which in future will be computed on the data that they upload about you, the patient. So if more than a percent or so of their patients opt out, the GPs lose serious money. Now, if you are one of the several million people who opted out of the summary care record in 2008-2009, your opt-out will be disregarded, so you have to do it all again. And this makes me wonder why it is that the NHS now becomes like Facebook, where the privacy settings are changed every year or two, and all the people who have with great trouble opted out of having their stuff shared now suddenly find that it's universally accessible, and so you have to scramble to understand the new privacy settings and opt out all over again. Why is it that the NHS and Facebook behave in the same sort of way? Well, to a certain extent, it's because powerful interests want to make commercial use of the data, of your data, um, for various purposes. And we just blogged recently how, for example, despite claiming that our stuff wouldn't be sold, there's a BT company in America uh, boasting an information week about how it will make 50 million people's records accessible to corporate American healthcare firms. And so this is how things are starting to line up. The curious thing is that if you don't opt out, the number of people in the NHS alone who have access to your records is about 830,000. That's the number of people who have an NHS smart card. And that's almost exactly the same as the number of people in America who had top secret clearances and were therefore able to get hold of your stuff, at least in theory, through prison type mechanisms. Right? You can't keep a secret with a million people. <clears throat> what does it mean for civil society? Well, I reckon that we have to keep on pushing back on scare <coughs> We have to push back on terror scaremongering, because how you actually stop um, violent political crimes um, is by removing, to the greatest extent, the incentive for them. So angry young guys in Bradford have got a chip on their shoulder about something. You know, you want them to be in a position where somebody can have a word with them, rather than a position where they will be driven away from society and in the end be radicalized and end up doing something silly. Community relations are much more important. We have to push back on the scaremongering about pedophilia and grooming. We have a lady at Cambridge who's doing a PhD on this looked at something like 200 um, instances of grooming from a large UK um, city police force. And it turned out that all of the victims were persons 13, 14, 15, just under the age of consent. Uh, and none of the so-called predators uh, were over 30. So the typical case was you know, a 15-year-old having an affair with a 19-year-old. Now, there may occasionally be issues about that, but it is not the sort of thing that justifies the wholesale demolition of human rights. And I would suggest that the appropriate way to deal with this, with this is to talk about children's rights instead. Turn it round and see it from the point of view of the kids, rather than from the point of view of the secret police. About the war on drugs, I think um, 
similar things must be said. And one of the powerful things that I've found when talking to this about people is if someone says, I've got nothing to hide, I've got nothing to fear, say, well, you know, what about your mum and dad? What about your kids? What about your uncles and aunts? Are you sure that every single one of them has got nothing to hide and nothing to fear? Remember Jackie Smith? She would nothing to hide, but her husband certainly did. This is how you bring it home to people. It's not just about them, it's about the people that they care about. But how do we turn that into a powerful, effective campaign? How do we find you know, the snappy um, advertising slogan, the, um, the slogan that counteracts nothing to hide, nothing to fear? So overall, what did Snowden teach us? Well, in a sense, he didn't teach us anything because almost everything was already known. But in another sense, he taught us a huge amount because it made a whole lot salient and it fitted together into a picture that now can be explained to everybody. Um, it lets more people understand better how things are and how they have been for some time. But it's also a wake-up call because the move to cloud-based services means that a lot of this stuff is going to get steadily worse. What happens if you've got Google Glass? And Google knows all your thoughts. Everybody you fancy, everybody you glanced at for more than half a second. The police will come along and say, hey guys, we want a copy. Who can do something about that? Maybe Google can do something about it. If they want to sell Google Glass, maybe they have to give much better and more believable and more bankable guarantees and privacy than they have up till now. But privacy where it's needed is going to have to have both technical teeth and legal teeth. There are some things you can do with technology. I mean, I can arrange to have private communications at a distance with Ian or Wendy or whoever. But there are some things that we can't do with technology and that we can only do by means of the mechanisms of law and regulation. So what can we do in institutional terms? Well, I would love to be able to simply abolish um, and its former employer. I think that Britain, like Denmark and Norway, um, should have its um, domestic security stuff done by the police. I think we should treat terrorists as ordinary criminals. Uh, if that was good enough for Mrs. Thatcher, then that's good for me. But I doubt that we can get there, and so my view is that a transparent society, an ever more transparent society, is going to have to be a liberal one. And so this is going to redefine and re-energize the tussle between the Daily Mail reader and the Guardian reader in ways that I think will transcend the traditional left-right boundary because, of course, we have got both liberal and authoritarian people in both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And as politics develops, one of the things that we should be trying to do is see to it that the liberal side of the equation wins as often as possible. Now, there's, there's a problem here because people who are attracted to Parliament tend to be people who are instinctively authoritarian. If you like bossing people around, if you like exercising power, if you like seeing yourself on news night, if you like all this sort of stuff, you're more likely to be an MP. If you believe in the pursuit of knowledge, you may become an academic. If you believe in the pursuit of money, you will go and start a business and so on. This is this natural process of self-selection. So we have a problem in that the people who make the decisions are people who are selected for being authoritarian. And in the long term, is the real threat the NSA or is it Facebook? The NSA just observed that Facebook and Google and so on had accumulated everybody's thoughts and they went along and they said, we'd like a copy, please. What does democracy look like in a world of Google Glass? and raised this point, which I, I thought was absolutely first class. Another point, how does it interact with globalization? If the real decisions are taken in Washington, and we don't matter, right, because we're not US citizens, and so the US Supreme Court won't give us any more human rights than a goldfish has, um, then what are the implications of that? Do we end up with world government? Do we end up being American colonies? Do we end up in a, a fresh Cold War with China? If we end up with a global society, then what happens when it becomes moribund? It's not if, it's when. It always happens eventually. In the old days, there was always more than one society. China may have rotted, but Rome was rising in the West and, and, and then Western Europe. 
what happens to the planet if there is a long, slow decline like that which happened in post-Ming Dynasty China? If there are never going to be any red bearded Scottish pirates to turn up at Hong Kong and uh, beat the Chinese Navy in a fight and thereby alert the Chinese Emperor to the fact that he missed a trick or two. These, I think, are the real big long-term problems. And if we're going to tackle them, then the question facing us as technologists and activists is what sort of new technical tools can we create or what new social tools can we create that might help us win these particular fights? Now, we don't really know yet what the fights are, but we may have some idea of what some of the important battles in those fights might be. And hey, we're here to brainstorm. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, um, and to be honest, I wasn't really sure um, what I was going to say today. My name is Nick Pickles. I'm the um, director of a campaign group called Big Brother Watch. Um, some of you may have seen me on Newsnight <laughs> in response to Ross's point. Um, occasionally, they have people who are, are, are not from a certain political view. Um, so, in trying to buy myself some more time to figure out exactly what it is I want to say, I thought I'd start with a straw poll. Um, Ross mentioned the communications data bill, and as an activist and a campaigner, I'm interested to see how you guys responded. So, just out of interest, show of hands, how many people wrote to your member of parliament when the comms data bill was being considered? A little bit lower than I was hoping for. And take, keep your hand up if you didn't use 38 degrees and you wrote the letter, wrote the letter yourself. Okay, so I think I've got seven people. And of those seven, how many of you met your MP? One, two, we're at two? No response. Two and a half. Okay, so th th this suggests to me that even within the informed community, we may actually have a problem. And this is something that I've been very concerned about um, in the two years that I've been doing this job, which is that we have phenomenal expertise working with the community on cryptography, on the digital economy issues, on privacy, on the social issues, and they never actually talk to the politicians. And what I find when I talk to politicians is that most of them can barely use Facebook, let alone understand what PGP is, or understand why it's a good thing that cryptography protects your medical records, and that having a back door into it actually compromises security in a way that we would expect the agencies to protect. So the fact that so many of you didn't write to your Member of Parliament and didn't meet your Member of Parliament then makes me think very clearly. The classic question that we heard during the Commons Data Bill when I came to events like this was, do these people not get why this is a bad idea? And we had exactly the same thing when Claire Perry was pushing um, default blocking and the Daily Mail, do these people just not understand how the internet works? And we all knew this, but the 650 people in the House of Commons who make the decisions about the law had zero insight whatsoever into the technical issues, the moral issues, the very, very real economic issues. And so they went with the fact that, well, I don't want to campaign against the Daily Mail, so I'll just let this go along. And this is still the case. Senior cabinet ministers who are sympathetic to our objectives will turn around and say, I've had one or two letters from my constituents. There's an old, an old adage in Parliament of MPs know how important things are for their own political survival based on their post banks. So to me, there's a, a very clear political reason why Julian Hopper is one of the most involved people on these issues. It's partly because he's very aware that a huge number of people in his constituency regard these issues as very important. Talk to another MP and they'll say, well, if I've only had two letters and no one's ever mentioned it at surgery, actually, I can probably ignore this and it doesn't make the blindest bit of difference <coughs> if I get elected. So I'll ignore it. So what really worries me is the challenge that the campaign actually has is informing politicians of the issues involved. And when you talk to them and you say, Here's how encryption works. Here's how it protects your bank details. 
if you want to go after the dark web by just shotgun breaking encryption, here's what it means for you. It does make your financial security more vulnerable. It makes your correspondence with your constituents more vulnerable. It makes your personal life more vulnerable. And then they sit there and go, that's a very good point. This does seem a very bad idea. But actually, there's a gap. And this is something that Tim Berners-Lee said last week at the Web, Web Index launch, is that everyone in the room said, Snowden has exposed something of fundamental importance. You go two miles down the road to Westminster, and 600 of 650 MPs say, everything's fine. Spies spy, so what? And so we have a real challenge to cross that barrier. And so if there's one thing that I will take from today, and I hope you all take from today, is if you care about these issues, talk to your Member of Parliament. And make sure your friends who care about these issues talk to their Member of Parliament. And when your Member of Parliament says something in a local newspaper about why we need the Snoopers Charter, because people use Skype, write to the local newspaper to tell him that the Snoopers Charter doesn't have anything to do with Skype because it's a foreign company. Don't just sit in these kind of forums and say, <clears throat> I know better, we all know better, this is a dumb idea. You have to go out there and talk to people who are not the, not the people who come to these kind of events. And so that's the first problem for me. The second problem is actually that I think we still are struggling to decide what it is we want. Um, I've sat in meetings where people have said we should shut down GCHQ overnight. I've had other people say actually we need judicial oversight of all surveillance. And then somebody else will say, oh, but the judges are just as corrupt as the politicians, you can't have that. And we have a huge argument about what the policy issues are. So then when somebody says, okay, there is a problem, what should we do? Nobody knows. So I think there's a really short-term pressure and events like this are really important to both figure out what we can do as individuals, but then what do we want government to do? If we're going to make this a national issue, I think we can, then what do we want to happen? Now, for me, the, one of the really powerful things is it's not just about the privacy of personal communications. It's the privacy of business communications. We live in an increasingly global economy, as Ross said. Why would a business base themselves in London, in Silicon Valley, if their intellectual property, if their customers have no protection? And as Ross said, the way that the, the American government's response was, don't worry, this is just about foreigners. At which point various people, Mark Zuckerberg being the first one, pointed out that's all very well and good, but quite a lot of my customers are foreigners. And so how do I have a business in the US? Now I guarantee you the political sway, sway of power between authoritarians and liberals, there are people on the authoritarian end of the spectrum who might not agree that GCHQ is intruding on everyone's privacy, but if they think it will mean that businesses don't invest in Britain and go to Berlin, not, on, not on authoritarian, it's not liberal, is they worry that the British economy will suffer. And so there's different issues that work for different people. And the economic impact of what we now know is huge. So if you are talking to your MP and he says, spy, spy, they're just going after terrorists, the argument isn't always that argument. You can turn around and say, OK, if that's what they're doing, the collateral damage is they're making our country much, much less attractive for people to invest in, and surely that should concern you. And actually, you change the debate. And I think there's something that I've learned from being part of the Snoopers Charter campaign for what feels like the third time now, maybe the fourth, and there's going to be a fifth, um, is we keep hitting the same barriers is when it comes in, there's a very small number of people in Parliament who get the technology. And it's very, very difficult in defence of politicians. David Blunkett said he gave Theresa May two pieces of advice when she became Home Secretary. And the first piece of advice was don't believe a word that your officials tell you. The second piece of advice was, but remember, you're the Home Secretary. And if something happens on your watch, you're the Home Secretary. And so I think we can't just afford to give politicians this idea of, you don't get it. Somehow a, you're less informed, you're a bit dim because you don't understand the internet. When actually, 
they, pay, they face a staggering pressure that very few people ever face. So we need to give them an alternative. And so if there is a problem that can be solved in a better way, help people solve problems. Now, there are issues at present around how the internet is used by criminals, but it didn't require the massive snoopers charter and a blank check. It required a few specific things, most of which was actually training within the police to use the data that was available. But actually, if you have a huge argument of it's us or them, it's binary yes or no, you lose the things that are important. So I hope today we can actually share our, our expertise with the outside world to say why these issues are important, can something be done in a positive way, and what should be done, as Ross said, for the future to make sure that the kind of overreach we've seen doesn't happen again. And I think it is overreach, and this comes back to quality of law, it comes back to quality of oversight. I don't think we have either right now. But what bothers me is that rather than having an engaging debate with the political sphere about policy, we end up having a technical argument within ourselves. And I go to countless events where everybody agrees with everybody, and then nothing happens. So if there's one thing that I think we should probably discuss in the panel is what happens next? Where do we go? And I will shut up now because actually the question answer session is the really interesting bit. But if there's one thing that you should all do, it's next time the Snoopers Charter comes back, go meet your MP, please. Because then when the rest of us go and meet them, they know their constituents care can take care too. So hopefully next year, when we have an even bigger and better crypto party, when I say who met their MP, everybody's hands go up. Thank you. Do I need this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, it's kind of hard to follow the three of them, but I'll try. Uh, okay. So there was this guy, uh, Vladimir Ivanovich Lenin. You might have known, never heard of him. Um, he said once, "Cedo uh, delat." What is to be done? And made that into a kind of big uh, overarching question, but without actually stating what the actual problem was. And this is one of the things we've seen quite a lot of uh, in a kind of post-Snowden days, is lots of people are running around saying, oh, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? But very little is being done to actually nail down what the exact problem is. So um, the way I see it, there's essentially four different uh, approaches to the problem. There is the internal problem for states, there's the external problem for states, there's the, um, the, the existential problem of mass surveillance, and then there is uh, the kind of broader trend problem on a political scene. So uh, externally, you know, and I'm going to try and go through these very quickly, uh, externally, you know, we, we have found ourselves in a situation where uh, Rousseff refuses to, or um, no, yeah, Rousseff refuses to visit Obama, Obama refuses to visit Putin, um, Morales is being forced to visit Kirchner, or uh, no, not Kirchner, the um, uh, Austrian president, and you know, it's all a big mess. Uh, and if you had been cryogenically frozen in the 1950s, and we're woken up today and uh, put, you know, uh, told what is going on, then you wouldn't believe your ears because we're basically in a situation where um, the uh, post-dictatorial uh, South America is the place in the world where the uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights is actually being upheld, uh, whereas the Western states are using exactly the same argumentation as they previously used to define the USSR as the enemy as a way of justifying their activities, right? Um, and in that kind of setting, uh, things tend to break down diplomatically. We're, we're seeing lots of diplomatic feuds coming up, uh, for instance, with Indonesia and Australia right now. We're seeing more and more uh, conflict coming out in the diplomatic scene, which is going to uh, have a negative impa impact on, on global trade. And just uh, from a globalization perspective or a trade perspective, it's really uh, getting, getting quite pear-shaped. Um, on top of that, there's the internal issue that, um, uh, as uh, William Burroughs said in The Naked Lunch, uh, an effective police state does not need police. 
um, or put slightly differently, uh, kind of through the uh, terms of Battlestar Galactica, um, somebody said there, uh, William Adama, I think it was, uh, that if um, uh, the reason we separate between the police and the military is that if you uh, if they're done by the same people, the, the people who protect us from uh, outside enemies are the same people as are supposed to protect and serve, then sometimes you get into situations where the, uh, uh, the actual enemies of the state are coming from within the state rather than from without. So from a kind of uh, uh, state governance perspective, everything's getting quite bad. Um, then there's the existential problem, which is that... Um, all of these surveillance programs, uh, PRISM, Tempora, Boundless Informant, and so on, are effectively software. And if we do a rough comparison to nuclear arms, which is always kind of uh, nicely uh, hyperbolic and, and whatnot, um, one of the things that you see is that um, nuclear arms, well, there's about 10,000 nuclear warheads in the world that have uh, been constructed, at least that we know of. Um, and you know, these exist in, in singular places, they exist in a scarcity economy, they can be visually accounted for, they can be identified, uh, sometimes they do get lost, but let's not get, get into that, uh, there's a tool incident. Uh, but, you know, broadly, the most important thing about nuclear weapons is that they can actually be dismantled. Now, if you look at software, software does not exist in a scarcity environment, it exists in a uh, environment where you can have infinite copies running all over the internet and you know uh, we we know about NSA having backdoored 80,000 computers there may well be more and we don't know which computers are, these are we don't know what's running on them on their behalf and it's basically impossible for us to go around and say well you know um, uh, we've found all of the computers that Prism and Tempora and whatnot are running on and have disabled them so that puts us into this weird essential <coughs> situation where if, you know, even if in our, you know, in this kind of crazy scenario um, that's never going to happen, but, you know, imagine that Obama were to go on TV tonight and say, well, look, we've realized that this was a really bad idea, so we've decided to turn them all off. We're going to stop this, this uh, surveillance, right? Nobody could actually believe him because there is no way to, to prove that you've dismantled all of these programs. There's no way to prove that you've shut down every piece, uh, piece of hardware that's running the software. And there's no way of, of counting how many copies are actually in existence in the world. So that puts us in a weird situation that we can never again trust our governments to ever you know, uh, protect our privacy again. That's really bad. That means that you know, uh, we've, we've been put into this kind of weird Cold War scenario where the weapons that are threatening our day-to-day -day lives, um, the, the things that, uh, that attack our privacy and our, our right to self-determination, are never going to stop being pointed at us. This is a Cold War that will never end, right? And this comes up to the fourth problem, which is the general trend problem, which is you probably noticed that over the last several years, uh, globally, the trend towards fascism has been on the rise. We are basically uh, seeing exactly the same kind of political climate as we were seeing in the 1930s, only this time they have the internet. Luckily, we also have the internet, right? So let's talk a little bit about statistics, because I like statistics. Um, the internet today has about 2.3 billion people on it. Uh, might be more, there are definitely more coming, but 2.3 billion people. I said billion last time, right? Okay. 2.3 billion people. Um, that's a lot of people. But what are they doing? Well, they are using Skype. There's 600 million people using Skype. Um, they're using email. That's almost everybody, 2.3 billion people, right? Uh, actually, the conservative estimate for that is 1.9 billion people. Um, then, you know, what email services are they using? Well, 435 million people are using Gmail. Uh, 350 million people are using Outlook or Hotmail or whatever it is they call it this week. Um, then there's you know 300 million or 270 million or so using Yahoo. And actually, if you just go down the line, the top 10 email providers are providing over 90%, possibly as much as 95% of all of the email accounts in the world. 
right? Um, then, you know, there's Facebook with its 1.15 billion people. There's, um, you know, all these other services. Dropbox has 175 million users. You know, no matter which technology you look at, we're basically seeing a situation where everything is very heavily uh, put into um, very few relatively large silos. And all of these things are very poorly encrypted. If they're encrypted at all, they generally have backdoors. They, they are essentially controlled by the states. So we're in this situation where basically we're all using the same tools and they're all spying on us. Aha, solution, right? That means that if we want to fix this situation, we basically need to do two different things. Well, uh, there's actually a third thing, but uh, so the, the first one is we need to decentralize everything. We need to move out of these silos. We need to uh, figure out a way to move the, the top 100 million users off Gmail, preferably in the next year, right? Um, then we need to get the rest of the 335 million who are left out in the next five years after that. Um, not just Gmail, it's all of the things. We need to replace Skype with something nice. We need to build tools to replace all of the, uh, all of the systems that we're using today. Decentralized, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, as much as possible. And the nice thing is that we can actually do this because the internet was originally designed that way. We just need to change the way the service offerings are built up. The second thing is we need to add strong encryption layers to everything. This means right down at the, at the bottom layers, uh, right from the network layer up, maybe we even say the data link layer should be encrypted. Maybe, yes, probably. But uh, most uh, particularly, we need every application that's running on our network stack to be very well encrypted. Uh, this means, well, on the one hand, just adding things like TLS, although we might think that TLS is broken, but also stronger things. Uh, I actually think that uh, uh, SHA-3 is probably okay, but um, that's just because I like sponges. Uh, but generally, you know, every piece of cryptography uh, that is in existence needs to be reviewed, and every application that we build needs to have those features. Um, now, those two things don't come for free. Uh, the third one, by the way, is uh, that we need to end, uh, strengthen all of the hardware endpoints. Uh, that's a much harder problem to solve. Uh, that's the one that, that mostly the general public doesn't have to worry as much about. Uh, but you know, uh, if we focus on the, on the first two, these essentially come down to the fact that Gmail is really, really easy to use. Skype is really, really easy to use. Um, but if you look at you know, uh, the comparative offerings from, say, the free software movement, uh, we have Thunderbird, which is an, uh, suffering from massive bit rot. It's just like it's old and clunky. Uh, we have uh, things like Squirrel Mail, which nobody really wants to use. And you know, then if we look at the alternatives to Skype, there's Jitsi, which is kind of just a piece of shit. Uh, you know, and uh, everything that we've built is very good from a technical standpoint to a certain degree, but when it comes to servicing users, we've completely failed. And so this is why I say that the, the plan for uh, the technologists in the room and, and for technology in general over the next several years is to build the uh, acceptable alternatives to all of these things. I know that parts of that are going to be easy. I know that other parts of that are going to be very, very difficult. But that is the way that we can get out of this because uh, right now, you know, I agree uh, with Nick that we do need to push the politicians. Uh, back in um, a, co a couple of years ago, there was this campaign in Sweden called Adopt a Social Democrat. Um, maybe we should be adopting a conservative or something like that. Uh, but, you know, um, pushing the politics is useful. Uh, similarly, litigation is really, really useful. Uh, Privacy International and the Electronic Frontier, Frontier Foundation are both, uh, just as examples, there's others as well, uh, doing very good uh, acts of litigation against uh, phone companies and, uh, and other actors, the NSA in, uh, itself included, um, for their roles in, in all this. Litigation will help. Uh, if nothing else, it at least makes it more expensive. And 
Uh, that's kind of where it comes down to because, look, the NSA and GCHQ and all these things have limited budgets, right? Um, if you look at the Snowden files, there's, um, there's a statement that the uh, DNI, the Director of National Intelligence in the US, has $56 billion per year as a budget. Um, if we add on to that US Cyber Command and the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence and the uh, National Intelligence University in the US, and we add on a GCHQ and um, the MIs here, and we add on you know, uh, Australian and the rest of the Five Eyes budget writ broadly, then it probably comes out to something around $120 billion per year. That's the total budget which currently exists to spy on all of us. Now here's the beautiful thing. If you take that number, $120 billion, and we divide it by the number of people on the internet, that's 2.5 billion, then it comes out to about uh, 13 cents per person per day. That is the price of spying on every one of us right now. And in reality, we don't need to make all security perfect for everybody. We just need to price the NSA off the market. So the goal, you know, we have, let's say, five years. The goal in the next five years is to raise the price of monitoring each individual, the average price, from 13 cents per person per day to $10,000 per person per day. <laughs> because there's no way in hell they are ever going to be able to match that with budgetary items. And the, uh, that uh, $10,000 per person per day means that they have a total surveillance capacity of about 32,000 people per day, which is still way too much. But, you know, okay, spies will be spies, as the politicians tend to say. So, you know, let's let them spy on some people if they're willing to pay for it. But, you know, let's make it really, really expensive for them. So we've got a, a bit more than half an hour for questions. And what I just ask you is try and keep them focused and brief, and we'll, we'll give everyone on the panel a chance to chip in for each one if we can. And, and uh, I'd like to fit as much in as possible. And I don't really want to have to step in and, and, and ask people to wrap it up. So keep it, keep it tight. And apart from that, let's go. Yes, one. Can I get this to a collective? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you all for your uh, presentations. They've been hugely inspirational. Um, I just want to underscore what Samar said about user experience, because I think it doesn't get said enough. Um, I, I completely agree with you that we need to build tools that are usable, that are beautiful experiences, that we can't expect people to use tools just because they're open or give them control of their data, um, and especially tools that can compete in the consumer space. Um, so I just want to thank you for bringing that up. And the question for you is, um, I know I'm, I'm doing a lot of research in this area right now, but um, do you know of any such projects that are happening right now? Just give you a lead to talk about them. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. Um, so, yeah, um, we've met. Uh, so, yes, uh, I know of several. Um, uh, it would take a while to talk about all of them. Actually, uh, so I, even though I said Jitsi is a piece of shit, I do know that the developers of Jitsi are working really hard to try and fix it. Um, so, you know, it's not really, uh, I, I don't mean it against them, I mean it uh, against the software as it currently stands. Uh, I'm also involved with a project called Mailpile, uh, which is what Errol was alluding to, um, uh, which is uh, basically a, um, intended as a webmail alternative to Gmail that you can run on your laptop or in a VPS or wherever you want to. Um, first kind of alpha developer version will be released in January. Uh, you can actually get it on GitHub right now, but uh, basically that's exactly our goal, make, uh, make something that is feature compatible with Gmail as far as that goes, but then offer uh, strong encryption right out of the box and make it really, really easy to use. Um, there's lots and lots of other projects, I'm not gonna uh, dwell on them too much, but yeah. I'm just speaking on that first comment you made, um, one very stock example is burned into my memory, which is I had a new computer in 2007 with the obligatory Windows Vista on it. And I was thinking, what the hell are you supposed to do with this? It was completely counterintuitive. Then I met my partner who, worked, who opened up this whole brave new world of Linux and Ubuntu. And it was like, oh, thank God, Ubuntu, I can use this. It's perfectly intuitive. 
And I have to say, even my mother can use it really easily. I mean, she's always the acid test in these sort of matters. So that's one very basic example where a product is offered from the open source community, which works better than all the proprietary crap out there. Um, it's much easier to use. And I think that's the sort of level we need to, to stick to with other and potentially more secure open source stuff we can offer. There may be an opportunity here um, if... Um NGOs and other civil society groups could start sharing some tool chain with the small corporates that I refer to because then we could harness a bigger developer community. The problem there, however, is this. Um, last year, I came across the first case where somebody had deliberately contributed a vulnerability to a major open source project. Um, it was um, a library that's used in graphics and browsers. I'll be no more specific than that. And this was done by somebody who presumably just wanted to sell the villain for a quarter of a million dollars to one of the predatory companies who then sell to the people like the NSA. If this is now going to be part of the future, um, then will in the future we have to ask open source developers to show a passport and two gas bills before we let them submit any code? <laughs> That's not the way to go because the spooks are far better at manufacturing passports and gas bills than we are. <laughs> So there are some opportunities there, but you know it's going to require a little bit of thought and a little bit of caution. Okay, next question. Yeah. Come on ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot who mentioned it before, but about uh, the subject of replacing and moving towards decentralized systems that are convenient now, be it uh, Skype or other. Here lies the, the difficulty. They have almost ubiquity already now in a centralized fashion. Skip now to a decentralized system such as some of the federated VoIP stuff that's coming out in the open source arena to peer to peer alternatives. Again, until your um, advocacy is actually working, you end up marginalizing, marginalizing yourself in the communication spheres and contact ability. And there, I think, is the, the perpetual fight between the centralized system and the decentralized system, which seems to be Absolutely. Um, the main thing here is the network effect. So um, the the traditional measure of that is um, that uh, the value of a network is roughly asymptotic to uh, the number of users of the network squared. Uh, and when you're uh, building something like Diaspora, uh, you know, which was intended to be a Facebook replacement, peer-to-peer uh, -peer one and whatnot. Um, one of the problems that they faced was, well, there's nobody using this. Why would anybody want to use it? Uh, and yes, absolutely. This is why I'm focusing on email. Uh, email is really, really useful because um, it is by far the largest social network on the internet with its 2.3 billion users. Uh, I mean, it's more than twice as large as Facebook, but it is by design completely decentralized and peer-to-peer. -peer. The only thing is that we've allowed it to be siloized. So hopefully, you know, we can, uh, one of the things is, you know, email is 50 years old in two years. So it's, it's 48 years old as a technology right now. And over those 48 years, there has been virtually zero innovation with email. We can do a lot of really cool things with email now if we just set our minds to it, including, incidentally, uh, I have an idea in my head of how we can actually uh, implement um, uh, voice and video messaging uh, using email as a signaling transport, not, a, not actually a, um, uh, a voice and video transport, but just for setting up the connections. So, you know, there's lots of, um, lots of possibilities with email. It is already the biggest network effect, so let's use it. Well, to, uh, I, I agree, this is exactly the thing. Um, if you're an activist group, you'll have some public communications and some private ones. And the thing to do is to regard everything you put on Facebook as public, regardless of what the so-called privacy settings on Facebook appear to say. Um, I always took the view from when the web started 20 years ago that I put everything on the web that related to my public activities, be it my academic job or music hobbies or whatever, but nothing whatsoever about my private life so that nobody looking at my web page should know whether I'm straight or gay, let alone whether I'm married or single. 
Um, but of course the world has broken this. A few years ago my daughter sent me a friend request on Facebook and I turned it down saying sorry this is against policy. And she still whinges from time to time <laughs> that I won't join her friend circle. But I, I've actually maintained that rigorous separation between public and private. Now clearly this is something that you'll have to reinvent over and over again. And if you're an activist group you'll have some stuff that's definitely public, the stuff you show to the world. Some stuff that's mm, sort of public and that the NSA and the special branch and so on can see it. And some stuff that's really, really deep private and some stuff that's so private you don't even let them see the traffic data. But you have to be subtle about this. Remember that if you close off all the enemy's communications intelligence channels, then you also forgo the ability to deceive them. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Do you have another question? There's one up there. Sorry, I could have run past them. Past them. <coughs> <Sorry, shouting. coughs> so you have to speak pretty loudly. Uh, to, to what extent did the D notice uh, impact legislative improvements? Uh, the D notice of uh, the Snowden documents? Well, it certainly suppressed the spread of the story and discussion of the story. And the fact that. Does everyone, does everyone know what a D oh, notice sorry. is? Do you want to explain what a D notice is? It's a Defence Press Advisory yeah. Board. Something <laughs> a, a notice. So this is um, this is an evil concept within our notional democracy because you have senior spies and military types and politicians and senior uh, media types, editors and so on from national newspapers, who belong to this D notice committee to use its old name. And if any contentious story comes up, which might be published or has been published, then they get they meet up and they decide whether or not to censor any further coverage or to actually suppress the, the first story. So you have a situation where the media is complicit in its own censorship, which I think is disgusting to start with. Anyway, so of course the Snowden stuff started to come out and immediately there was a panicked D-notice slapped on it, which um, the Guardian didn't report, I don't think, for two weeks or something. Um, it was a delayed reporting. But of course we have seen the knock-on effect that other newspapers are much are very circumspect. If they even cover the Snowden stuff at all, it's usually just to attack. So it has suppressed free speech, suppressed legitimate discussion, and it suppressed um, proper political discussion and debate as well, I think, about his disclosures. And looking at how the coverage goes on the Snowden issue globally, because I live outside, I live on mainland Europe now, looking at the, the discussions uh, in the media and in the political environment in the UK, they are the most suppressed, the most useless, the most pointless of any other country. I mean, even America, they're having proper congressional hearings and political debates and main media debates. And across mainland Europe, huge debates about many of these issues. But in the UK, our establishment has closed ranks, they've rallied around, they've suppressed any proper meaningful change and discussion. And because of that um, supine approach, it will inevitably impact on any potential legal reforms, legislative reforms. And it's a bit like Nick was saying, inevitably, we'll probably have to have round five soon of the Snoopers Charter. And this, of course, with hindsight, we can all see very clearly, was a debate, a law they wanted to pass in order to cover the arses of the, uh, GCHQ that was already doing the snooping. So <laughs> there was just a sort of bit of back coverage, I think. But it's this suppression of the debate that is very damaging across the whole spectrum of democratic activity in the UK, I think. Um, uh, so, I guess, I guess some of this may come out on Tuesday when Alan Bridger goes before Home Affairs. Um, <laughs> I've heard him say publicly that the Defence Advisory Committee has seen every story that's been published with the exception of the first one, and they haven't tried to suppress. The rumour goes, if there are two stories they did, it was Belgicon and it was Tall, with a two. Um, actually, I don't think they did. I think the Belgicon one is a bit weird. Tall got run. Um, What's done more damage for press coverage? The D Notice Committee or Leveson? Leveson by a million miles. The, the, the Daily Mail was the strongest newspaper on the Commons Data Bill, even, even including The Guardian, actually. Um, the Telegraph was pretty good, and it hasn't always been. Um, the attacks on The Guardian have not been in a conspiratorial sense because they believe in mass surveillance, it's because they blame The Guardian for Leveson and what they're now debating. Um, and that's come from very, very high within those newspaper groups to the point where I think some of the journalists who work there are a bit embarrassed about it. But in terms of the, the lack of wider outrage that you've got in the US, I mean, every interview that I do with foreign media, they sit there and go, why on earth aren't you arguing about this? And so far, the two reasons I've come up with is the James Bond problem, 
in that for some reason bricks all think that spooks are all like James Bond and therefore we would never want to question it. Um, and Bletchley Park is there is this kind of like post World War II Bletchley Park feeling. Um, but I go back to the, every interaction I have with people in Westminster now is um, why should they turn up to a debate in Westminster Hall when none of their constituents think they should? And I think actually it's sometimes easy to blame the media and the institutions for a lack of public debate um, when actually a kind of essential part of a public debate is the public. And so if we're not getting really angry about this and we're not banging on our MPs' doors, then are people five streets away? And so I've lost count of the number of MPs that I've met who have turned around and said, I'm sympathetic, I think this is quite important, but actually there's 50 other issues. There's a hospital being closed, there's gas bills, there's fuel prices, there's job security, and they can only do so much. And so they're going to go with the ones where the public are. And right now I don't think that, that we're making enough noise from a public thing. Um, and I have three staff, including me. So trying to figure out how we can start that debate is a really, really big challenge. And any ideas on that, and, and anyone who's got resources, time, expertise, please share it. We need to pull it, because that's where I think we still need to work really hard. I don't mean to be really negative, sorry. I'm blaming the fact that <laughs> painkillers are wearing off. <laughs> <coughs> Another question? Uh, it was mentioned several times about the fact that the both the, the technology and the way we communicate on these issues is very complex for the general audience. And while I do despair about how difficult it is to set up a bird with edit mail for a non-technical user, it takes like 30 to 60 minutes to do it properly. When I'm doing it, you know, for a novice it might take two days. It's horrible. I always worry, so we need to make that better, but I don't think you should make it too simple. I don't think people will use crypto properly if this becomes a one-click install app in the Apple phone store, because then people have no idea what they're doing, which is, I think, the real problem in the first place. And in the same way, while I'm all <coughs> for coming up with these 50 slogan that should be on a million bumper stickers, I don't think we should reduce a thousand years of civil liberties development and discussion to, to the length of a tweet because now our fellow citizens have become so dumbed down that anything that's longer than 140 characters is difficult. So yeah, make things simpler, but not too simple because then I think very important things will be lost. But somewhere in the middle there is something to work for. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I agree. Um, I started using Gmail, for example, in 2005 when I was in a foreign country where communications were too difficult to use usual tools. I took the view then, and I take the view now, that if the FBI isn't part of your threat model, then Gmail is fine. Um, the, the Google folks have 200 odd security PhDs. The Chinese um, military intelligence guys attack them all the time. These guys are battle hardened. And unless the FBI turns up with a prison warrant, or unless they hoover your stuff off the backbone, you're, you're likely to be as well protected with a big service um, as you would likely to be able to do it yourself. The problem is when the FBI or their friends in MI5 or elsewhere start being part of the threat model. Right? Now, my view of such things is that it should be possible to provide things like webmail services, which are just as easy to use as Gmail, and which, for example, could be hosted either by a small corporate for its employees or by an NGO for its staff, its volunteers, and the other people who work with it. We had some experience training um, civil rights workers in Central Asia to use things like TAR and PGP and so on, uh, people ranging from guys in the stands to civil rights workers in Vietnam. And although there are some high threat environments like Vietnam, for most of these places, webmail that works, a Facebook substitute that works and so on, would do a hell of a lot of heavy lifting. And when you're, 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 you're speaking about people who are out there working in the field, trades union organizers, for example, you are not going to get them to turn into geeks because many of the, the personal abilities that you need to be an organizer, you need to be good with people, you need to be an empathizer, you need to have political type skills rather than software engineering type skills, these tend to be in tension with the skills that you need to operate current security products. So I believe strongly that we have to do usable security for activists as well as just for your, for your mum. Can I just make one very quick comment on top of that? 
Um, yes, of course, if you're making a threat assessment about who, uh, you know, who might be threatening you, um, now, of course, we have to remember that it, we, the FBI, MI5, the NSA, whatever, is a threat to all of us. That, this is what Snowden has revealed. It's no longer just targeted specific people for whatever reason that they come up with a justification for. We are all potentially, or we all definitely at threat. So I think this is why we all need to think about how to protect ourselves in order to ensure our privacy, because they won't guarantee it anymore. So, um, uh, incidentally, I did have my email, uh, Gmail account subpoenaed by the FBI uh, a couple Oops. of years ago. But it's okay, I, I never use Gmail, um, so you've got nothing, uh, but you know, I win. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, do, I do strongly disagree with uh, you, Arian, on this, uh, in part because you know, I've been uh, doing trainings for journalists and for activists in uh, use of security equipment for you know, uh, both physical and, and digital security for a number of years now. Uh, you know, uh, and a lot of these are journalists working in high risk areas. Um, yeah, I'm actually just next week going to be uh, doing trainings in, in Jordan for uh, Arab journalists who are working in, in conflict zones and whatnot. And really, like, um, the one thing that I always have as a takeaway from in doing that is, you know, these are people who already have enough things to worry about uh, and obviously security is very uh, high up on their agenda, but they do not really care whether their encryption key is uh, 2048 bits or 4096 bits. They do not care what the difference is between RSA and Algamal. Uh, they do not care you know, whether uh, anything, you know, uh, any of these things that we as technologists care about, uh, just simply they don't care. And this counts even more so for people who are not working in high risk zones such as doctors and lawyers who have a professional obligation uh, to protect uh, privacy and, and uh, you know, uh, protect information. But they just, uh, their jobs do not require them to, uh, to think about the intricacies of, of modern encryption technology. So really, you know, I want encryption to be so bleedingly simple that you do it uh, by default by accident, if need be, uh, and you are, by uh, you know, in general, fairly safe. Those who are in high risk situations obviously do need to get the training and do need to learn a thing or two about, uh, you know, raise the bar a little bit. But you know, we shouldn't have to force anybody to learn anything in order for everybody to be safe. But perhaps if there's a small thing I could add here, there's a guy who came to us so four or five years ago. Um, a missionary from Texas um, who tries to preach the gospel in Muslim countries. The small problem with this is, if you're a Muslim in Pakistan and you convert to Christianity, the penalty is death. So if you're trying to minister to such people, what do you do? Well, if you tell them to go and use uh, TrueCrypt, then how you get screwed is this. The Pakistani religious secret police will get someone to pretend to convert and will contact this missionary organization. Once they are told to use TrueCrypt, Pakistan Telecom will look for TrueCrypt traffic. And then everybody who's using TrueCrypt will get the door broken down at 6 in the morning and will have their fingernails pulled. So the only way you can provide um, protection in a circumstance like that is by using a tool that a lot of other people used. So what I did was sat down with this guy and I said, look, the only thing that will work for you is Skype. Right? Because there's millions of people in Pakistan use Skype to talk to family members overseas. But just make sure that you've got a different Skype name to talk to every single convert. Right? This is the sort of process that you have to go through when doing real ComSec in real hostile threat environments where if you screw up, people will get killed. But so right there you taught him something. Whether yeah. it's not it's not a technical thing, but it's an OPSEC thing. Sure. So you taught Learn. him something to be safer. That's my yeah. point. Yeah, 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 yeah but, 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 but you yeah. need a lot of stuff in the toolkit and you need to understand what it can do and what it can't do, and you've got to lead people through a process of evaluating the threats and figuring out what can help and what is likely to screw up. <coughs> okay, we, we, framed, we framed an issue there, and we've only got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to keep it rolling. I've got a few hands going up, so next question is up there, then you and then you. Uh, just, just as a consensus builder, I sort of have the feeling that we all more or less agree that we need better tools and we need them relatively easy and we need them fast. I think mean, there's a big opportunity to look at uh, building the project with uh, truly international cooperation because the Brits have 
quite hard to get into revolutionary mode, but there is a fair amount of countries up there that are much quicker. Yeah, we're good when we do, uh, though. Yeah. When, when we do. Well, yeah. 1688, yeah. Awesome. But if we, 1381. Coordinate, if we coordinate with the countries where the spirit and the knowledge is there, which is Poland, my country, Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, you can roll out tools very quickly, yeah. and you will get a lot of support, not just on the ground, but on the authorities as well, because they have good memories of when what happens when things go wrong. Trying to do things from UK is a little bit sort of wrong way of going about it, because it's still very few them, not just in terms of IT, but also the mental attitude. So I think if we look for coordination of the assets which are in place, and do it truly in a united way, you will probably get it out of the ground in six months' time. Yeah. Okay, uh, had a question down here. I have a question uh, about email because it's uh, it's one probably of the most spread one is per technology. And if we get email right, it's probably one of the most electrical things which can happen. And uh, Ross was talking about uh, the fact that if you are in China, you're, if you are using Gmail, you're fine because it's, uh, if you are afraid of Chinese uh, espionage. Uh, can we solve this problem based on the game theory as, as some kind of arbitrage that you can actually use different services for different purposes and make sure that that you are not at risk basically of the, from the, uh, the just agencies which compromise uh, the services which are placed in their own countries? Well, I, I suspect this is always going to be a dynamic thing. In that if enough people start using a service which annoys a big agency enough, they'll either attack the service or block it or subvert it somehow or another, or they will track the people who use it and break their doors down. Um, but then an awful lot of stuff that's online is intrinsically um, adversarial anyway. For example, if you get the top hit on Google for digital camera, that's worth a million dollars a month. So of course people will keep on gaming search engines. Of course people will keep on gaming privacy tools. And um, the question for you, if you're an activist, is how do you learn what's going on? How do you keep up to date? If you're using the tools of five years ago, then quite possibly you're being screwed. How do you find out? What's your situational awareness? How plugged, are you, how plugged in are you to what's actually going on? OK, <clears throat> just want to say I've got three more hands up. We've only got a few minutes. I don't want to s s uh, skew anyone's questions, but we've established that there's technical processes and political processes and possibly other processes. We've had quite a lot of talk about tools. It'd be good to get a few things in about other kinds of measures or other approaches to the problem. Hi, um, I just want to uh, uh, throw a span in the works here. It seems to me like politics is more important than most people think because uh, email is a very good choice, I agree, for the reason that it's distributed and so forth. But what about social networking? And the social, I'll just talk about the strength of weak ties, <coughs> discovering people you don't know well that's kind of peripheral to your networks is where you get most value out of social networks and so forth. And the social is very important. Now, I can't see how encryption is going to work in a social network where you discover people that you don't know, right? So uh, it seems to me that uh, this group of people are so used to, to uh, immediately grabbing to, 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 to more technological solutions that politics is, is, is left on the wayside. Sorry, and uh, it's, it's, it's down the same route again. <laughs> <Nick>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to talk? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I think something I've um, found fascinating over the past few years is um, everyone said 2005 would be the social media election, and it wasn't. And then they said 2010 would be. Now we're all saying 2015 is the Twitter election, and everyone has to be on Twitter. Actually, that's a brilliant opportunity to engage with people about not just the policy issues, but actually legitimate security issues if you're running to be a member of parliament. You know. The, the kind of vetting that, vetting that that Annie talked about, but also the fact that um, you know, can your password be spoofed as a social engineering attack because of other information that you've shared on Facebook and um, you know, having run for Parliament, the idea that you can have privacy and run for Parliament is kind of a bit knackered now because everyone expects you to be on Facebook. So that's an opportunity for us to engage in a way which is saying you want to use these tools in the same way as the public do. And here's the risks that you're exposing yourself to. And don't you think it's right we should try and fix them? Some will be technology, and some will be legal. And I think actually making 
MPs realise that the legal framework doesn't work for them as individuals is a really, really powerful message that, you know, nothing like a bit of self-interest to get people to do things. Just one very quick comment. I mean, um, getting beyond the, the technological tools, again, and even perhaps beyond politics to a more fundamental question. What is national security? What are the realistic threats to our national fabric, the existential threats to the fabric of our nation? Once we identify those, and they have never been defined realistically or legally, only when we've really got a clear idea of what the realistic threats are can we then protect ourselves and police them. And until we get to that point, the, we'll have mission creep in who might be deemed to be a threat because there's no clarity of thinking amongst our political class too. But most people don't even give it a second thought, what is national security? The only time our national security is ever really under threat is at times like the Second World War. Even when the provisional IRA was putting bombs down at will on British streets the 70s to the 90s, it was not threatening the existence of this nation state. So I think if we can drag our politicians back to that fundamental question and then work out, okay, these are realistic threats, this is the best way to police them, this is the best way to protect people in a proportionate manner within a functioning democracy, then we can start saying, how do we implement those? And that's where the tech comes in and potentially other forms of organising. No, can I make <laughs> Uh, so just to throw in there, uh, I have this kind of little test that I run. Whenever people say the words national security, uh, they mean one of two things. It's like an overloaded term. They either mean the security of the state or they mean the security of the people living in the state. Very rarely do they mean both at the same time. Uh, actually, if, they were to, if these two concepts were to overlap perfectly, then we would live in a pretty good state. But uh, as uh, states become more and more uh, dictatorial, fascistic, uh, you use whichever term you wish, uh, these two terms tend to uh, drift apart. And we are at a point where if there's any overlap left, it is fleeting. So um, you know, ask yourselves, which one do they mean? And don't accept the security of the state as a legitimate form of national security. <laughs> Um, I agree 100% with um, what's just been said. We had a wonderful seminar at Cambridge two weeks ago from the chief geek at um, GCHQ about smart meters. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and th th this was an issue that various people had talked about. Why do you put a computer in everybody's electricity meter if this means the Chinese can log in and switch off the entire nation's power supply at will? <laughs> well, it turned out that GCHQ revealed exactly what they mean by the security of the state, by what they bothered to protect. Will they protect you, the um, electricity consumer, from being ripped off by the power company? No, he said, that's not my problem. Will they protect the power company from being ripped off by you? No, nope, that's not my problem. Will they stop the politicians from ripping us off by spending 15 billion on smart meters that won't work above my pay grade? So what do, they, what do they care about? What they care about very much is that the Chinese should not be able to interrupt the transmission or distribution network in such a way that they interrupt the electricity power supply to Cheltenham or to Boot. <laughs> <laughs> or to the half dozen departments at the dark heart of the state. That is what the security of the state means. It means the security of GCHQ, the Ministry of Defense, the Cabinet Office, 10 Downing Street, and even the Ministry of Defence you could dispense with for a week because the troops around the world have their orders anyway. <laughs> this is what national security has come to. And fixing that is a real serious problem. Let's redefine the security of the state as the security of the citizens. Great. <coughs> okay. We have two minutes. And I've got several questions. <laughs> and I'm not going to get round them. And I apologise for that. But I don't apologise for having given the speakers a good run for the money because hopefully it's set all, it, uh, all our minds working. It doesn't stop here, the conversation. It will continue outside. It will continue in the pub later, as we'll come to. Yes, okay. Well. And you know, you know who, yeah, right? And you know who these people are, so you can seek them out. Yeah, put, 140 your, characters. put your questions to them. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to take Jimin's question first because you're next on the question list. Yeah, you're going to take that offline. Yeah. Then, sorry, actually, next was up, up there. And I'm feeling feeling it's going to fall off the edge. I'm sorry. Just here. Shout it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. shout. That's good. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to. One of the things that I think was really come home from everything that you've been saying is that perhaps we've been looking at technology in isolation too much, providing the solutions, whereas, in actual fact, 
at the end of the day, just as when the Gutenberg press was invented, it was just another means of transmitting ideas. Technology is a facilitator, and that we actually need to, you know, we have the technology to create effectively a paradise in any country in the world that we have at the moment, and yet for some reason we choose the same old Martian jackboots. And I was just wondering how you feel instead would you be using it to, as it were, reignite, I think you were talking very much about what direction we're going in, how we could, how we could as it were, be using it to facilitate that. Mm. Have you two been thinking at the end there? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, there, there are mailing lists for that kind of question. <laughs> um, yes, no, absolutely. Um, so one, one thing that's becoming abundantly clear is that the nation state as it currently stands has very little interest in protecting the interests of the general public. Um, uh, the reason I use the word fascism so much nowadays is because if you look at the original 1920s definition of the term, it meant the, um, the perfect union of state and corporation. Um, now, you know, that is essentially what we're looking at. Whether you look at patent law, whether you look at uh, the different uh, you know, pieces of legislation which are passing around uh, media regulation or, uh, or consumer uh, protection or whatever, it is always geared towards protecting the interests of relatively few, relatively large companies uh, and sacrificing every other value we have uh, on that particular altar. So, you know, uh, while yes, uh, at crypto parties, we do tend to some, uh, somewhat uh, venerate the technological solutions and say, oh, let's just encrypt everything. Well, yes, absolutely, let's encrypt everything, but let us not be blind to the political implications of technology and the way in which the technology is shaping our reality. I absolutely agree, and I think the one thing that's really, really important is whenever um, a problem arises, take the common data bill, and the perception is that the problem has arisen because of technology, is pushing back and going, no, no, you know, you don't stop armed robberies by banning cars. <laughs> and actually, and something that the, you know, the, the civil society community and the tech community have been rubbish at, is pushing back in that way. And what has happened way too many times is just saying, well, they don't understand technology. And actually, I think that we need to push back and say, no, no, you don't understand the people and here's what technology does. And if I hear another MP stand up and say, Tor has been used by terrorists and paedophiles, <laughs> without even realising it's been funded by the US State Department, we're failing. And I'm getting bored of writing those letters because I have to write quite a lot of them. And we need to push back a lot more on that these are human issues, not technology issues. Um, I totally agree that we are sliding towards fascism. Um, in fact, I've taken to just calling it corporatism now, to go with <laughs> Mussolini's definition. Um, perhaps this is a note to finish on. It's just I'm going to take liberties with a very famous poem, which um, explains what it's like to slide into that sort of state. So this is a sort of updated version, which is, first they came for the Muslims, but I was not Muslim, so I did not speak up. Then they came for the domestic extremists, but I was not an activist, so I did not speak up. Then they came for the whistleblowers, but I was not a whistleblower, so I did not speak up. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up for me. Thank you. I think that sums it up rather nicely, um, but we can't push back technology. Uh, technology um, moves on, and sometimes if you look at military technology, it favors the offense, and sometimes it favors the defense. The pendulum swings backwards and forwards over the decades. Um, but when it comes to inventing technology, we can try and figure out what the problems are and what we want to try and invent in order to solve them. So I think it brings us back to the problem that Nick um, highlighted at the end of his first talk, is what are our asks? If you could be prime minister for a day with a workable majority, or US president with a majority in both houses of Congress, or the swing voter in the US uh, Supreme Court, what would you do? What sort of things would we do in an ideal world? And if you've got an idea of what that might be, then what sort of tools, what sort of organizations can we create that will help to move us somewhat, somewhat in that direction in the world we actually inhabit? We're going to have to wrap it up on that note, which seems pretty good. Okay, I want to thank everyone for participating, and let's thank the speaker.